Hello world, it's Siraj, and OpenAI recently released the O1 model series, which is the smartest AI model series in the world. But they didn't show source code for this. They didn't show the research paper. They showed a basic blog post and a model card. So I decided to reproduce it from scratch using, ironically enough, O1 preview. And I have generated an entire research paper around reproducing O1 using O1 Preview as an author and myself. And it was able to generate this. It's amazing. And I gave it the history of research that led up to O1 Preview and O1 Mini by giving it a ton of research papers from this awesome GitHub list called Awesome LLM Strawberry. And I gave it dozens of research papers from this year from last year and we're going to go over all of those this video is going to act as your introduction to o1 this is going to explain step by step both the generated research paper as well as the entire code base for what i'm calling o1 nano which is the third and missing model from openai's series of models except this one is open source and it is explainable, it is educational, and it is human readable because it is written in under 1000 lines of code. And without comments, it's actually more like 400 lines. But I very generously added a lot of comments to this code using O1 preview, of course. And this code is going to illuminate all of those processes and techniques that OpenAI used to make O1. And those processes include, of course, chain of thought reasoning. We all know that. We all know that O1 is reasoning by generating a chain of thoughts. We can see that in the ChatGPT interface. But what we don't know is how it's using reinforcement learning. And we're going to figure that out in this video. How is it using it during the training process as well as the inference process? What type of reasoning paths is it taking? We're going to find that out. What are the subtasks that it's generating during inference time? Um, is it adapting in real time? It is. And what are these reasoning tokens that OpenAI was talking about in their documentation? They said that now we developers have to deal with these reasoning tokens. You don't know what they are. You know, we're going to bill you for them. So we're going to figure out what these reasoning tokens really look like. So the first step in this video is to go through the research paper, and then we're going to go through the code. Take a look at this research paper. Basically, this paper is 20 pages long, so it's quite long, but we're going to introduce this research paper by starting off with the background, because I think the background is the most important part here. And it shows the limitations of previous models like GPT-3 and GPT-4. And those limitations include shallow reasoning depth. Now, I want everyone to understand right now that reasoning isn't some layer that they just attached to the end of the neural network and said, this is the reasoning module, magic wand, we have just added it. It's not a magic wand. Reasoning is now incorporated in every single aspect of training and inference. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that all of the logic is segmented into two types, the semantic logic and then the reasoning based logic. So this is happening in the loss function. It's happening in the construction of layers. It's happening in the attention layer. It's happening in self-correction. It's happening during training, during inference. All of the computations that are based off of reasoning are segmented, they're tokenized, and they're used specifically for training a reinforcement learning model that selectively chooses the most optimal chain of thought as it generates them in this tree-like process that we'll talk about. And none of the previous LLMs did that. They didn't generate at inference time all of these different possibilities. They just generated one linear output of semantic word tokens, which have their own properties, but they're not quite reasoning based. And it had a limited context of understanding because of this. So how did we get here? How did we get to O1? Well, here's how. First of all, we had chain of thought. Now, this was a very important paper that came out in 2022, actually, which showed that if we ask the LLM to reason step by step, 
it will do so. And this was then further validated by none other than Ilya Sutskever, who was one of the seminal authors in many of the seminal deep learning papers like Attention is All You Need, etc. Let's Verify Step by Step was the name of this other paper that was published last year. And the alignment between both of these papers involved asking the LLM to reason step by step. And when we generate synthetic data that involves reasoning, what we're doing is we're generating logic that is in one way translated into English, but it's still very valid logic to train our model on. What I mean is any chain of thoughts like step one, add five plus three, step two, add 10 plus eight, any kind of step-by-step -step sequential logic that we can encode into the model's layers will help it reason. And that's really what these two papers were trying to say. And they proved it by improving across a range of benchmarks, primarily math data sets. And we see that a lot in these reasoning papers that they're really focused on STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And why is that? because these fields lend themselves to sequential reasoning-based data sets. That was the first big breakthrough that led up to the O1 series. Now, the other one is reinforcement learning from human feedback. Now, ChatGPT itself already used that, but what makes O1 Preview unique is a couple things. How does it uniquely use reinforcement learning in this context? Now, I'm gonna sort of gloss over these parts of the paper because there's a lot here, but I'm gonna talk about the most important bits. Let's get to the model architecture. How is it using chain of thought, which I just talked about, and reinforcement learning to generate different optimal types of outputs than say GPT-3 or GPT-4 would? Well, let's figure it out by looking at the architecture. Well, the core components of the architecture are, first of all, a transformer encoder decoder. Now, all question and answer language models operate in this paradigm, so nothing new. But we've added a chain of thought module and a reasoning token generator. Both of these really segment different parts of the neural processing pipeline into reasoning specific data structures that are then used as signals as gradients during backpropagation to help improve the reasoning process specifically. So it's not only training the model to better predict the next word, it's training the model to reason better simultaneously in parallel. And how does it do that? Well, it uses multiple models, right? It's using one supervised learning model, but it's also utilizing reinforcement learning models. And reinforcement learning models are very, very expensive when it comes to your GPU RAM. And why is that? Because there's multiple versions of them running at the same time during inference and training. We have the policy and the value network. Both of them are trying to approximate different parts of decision-making for the model. And John Schulman, who was one of the authors of ChatGPT, discovered that in 2017. And I have written out the model architecture for this in this slide right here. So let's look at it. So basically the idea step-by-step -step is during training 01, here's how it's trained. We're giving it a set of data. That data includes chains of reasoning, you know, different algorithmic processes, step-by-step -step processes, how we put together certain diagrams and how we construct certain narratives. All of this is reasoning logic, and we're using that as input tokens during training time. And that is then fed into an embedding layer, which encodes it into a suitable format. So that's really just for formatting. And then, of course, the transformer encoder decoder, which will segment the question from the answer, the input from the output, the machine response from the human input, what will be the human input during inference time. And rather than just outputting that directly to the user, it's then feeding the result of all of those attention mechanisms that are embedded into there into this chain of thought module. And what this chain of thought module is doing is it's generating different subtrees of possible subtasks of what the valid reasoning steps could be for whatever the optimal objective is. In this case, it's, you know, input, add five plus three, output, it's gonna be eight, but you have to generate a set of subtasks to figure that out. Like what is addition, then equals, add that on, and then add eight. And so 
all of these steps are considered reasoning tokens, which the reasoning token generator specifically generates to feed back into the chain of thought module. And both of these are trained using reinforcement learning. And that's what you're seeing here with the policy network and the value network. They're using reinforcement learning to train this thing. And ultimately, that is what's output in the reasoning token generator, which outputs the tokens, which are not just the semantic tokens, which are the word based tokens, which have their own properties, but the reasoning tokens, which encode the computations that happen step by step during training inference in the training data itself and whatever is happening at inference time. This is amazing because it showed us that there is a new scaling law and that scaling law is not just the training time scaling law, but the inference time scaling law, which means the more time we give these universal function approximators that we call neural networks at inference time, the more likely they are to achieve whatever objective that we've given them. And that is a very, very important second scaling law. And you can't just prompt these things with one giant prompt and say, hey, this is replicating 01. No, now you see it's using different reinforcement learning paradigms during training, during inference, in a way that you can't just copy and paste into a giant prompt and replicate the results. No, you have to systematically train a model with reasoning at the core from every stage. And that's what we have here. Similar to GPT-3 and 4, it's using a transformer as its base, as its foundation. That's not different. But what's different is how it's using reinforcement learning during both training and during inference time. And that's what I want to talk about next. These reasoning tokens, they, they talked about them in this guide, but they didn't talk about how they were generated in the first place. So let's talk more about that, the reinforcement learning and the reasoning in particular. So I show some code samples here of how it works in the code, and we'll get into the code next. But reinforcement learning and reasoning are the two things we really want to talk about and, and focus on in this video, because those are the unique parts of, of this model. And they were applied to all these specialized data sets, these mathematical, scientific, logic based data sets. And, you know, I go through a lot of the code at the end of the research paper, which we're going to talk about, you know, the experimental results. These were all generated very similar to what they showed in the blog post uh, discussion. Interesting stuff. Conclusion, you know, citing the works and everything. This is good, you know, but I think now what's most important is that we look at the actual code. So let's look at the code here. That is going to be the most useful thing. And it's about 880 lines. So that's quite long. Let me show you a demo of the code. So essentially, once we're running the test, we can just ask it a question like uh, run the test demo. And then I'll say calculate the sum Wait, of five and seven. And then it's going to perform a subtask. It'll show the subtask and then it'll show the model's response. The sum of five and seven is 12. And it was able to generate this response based on its chain of thought reasoning that it trained on it's using adaptive reasoning and reinforcement learning at inference time as well to decide on the best subtask to use. And this whole GitHub had a great selection of research papers to look through. I thought another one that was really important was training language models to self-correct via reinforcement learning. So the key here is to be using reinforcement learning at every step of the way, as well as treating reasoning computations as their own distinct tokens to then train on. And these were the insights that all these researchers had across all these different research papers, REFT, reasoning with reinforced fine tuning. So they're using reinforcement learning in the fine tuning process, training large language models for reasoning through reverse curriculum reinforcement learning. All of these research papers are using reinforcement learning and reasoning tokens in particular, scaling inference time using reinforcement learning. You know, this chain of thought that it generates it's like a tree. It's like a Monte Carlo tree search. And similar to how AlphaGo used Monte Carlo tree search and reinforcement learning at inference time to beat Lee Sedol, the grandmaster of Go. Past 2000 years of human knowledge, beat in an instant by reinforcement learning. And that was Move 37. That particular moment, Move 37, where Lee Sedol didn't understand why the AI had made that move. Why? That alien intelligence. Why did it make that move? It made it because it was a different type of intelligence to human, but better at the same time. And that's the move that beat Lee. And in that case, 
it used Monte Carlo tree search at inference time to generate a tree of all possible subtasks. And then it selectively picked the best subtask using very similar techniques, a policy network and a value network. Both of them are used to compute a reward at different stages of both training and inference. And this reward function, it can be different, whatever the objective is, but the principles remain. And in the code, I used proximal policy optimization, which essentially during training, it creates two versions of the model. So it's very RAM intensive. You can run this yourself. And it then tries to approximate the policy of one and the other during training. So it's very RAM intensive as reinforcement learning always is, but it works and it gets the model to learn how to compute arithmetic-based chains of thoughts, both during training, when it generates that data, and during inference. And you can see it right here. You know, we're setting these magic numbers, the context window size, and you know, the max output tokens preview to what OpenAI said in their blog post. But these class files are really important. Positional encoding, a transformer, a forward pass. All these things are in all GPTs. But in the O1 model class, we're adding in the reasoning logic, the reasoning decoder, and that is add it right here to this generate completion function, which not only generates tokens for words, but it generates reasoning tokens as well. And in the PPO class, the proximal policy optimization class, it's computing the advantages of different chains of thought that it generates both during training and during inference. And the vocabulary here is very simple that we're using. It's just five plus three equals eight, six plus 10 equals 16, three minus two equals one, six times four equals 24, right? And all of these are just chains of thought for the model to train on, to then be able to take an input like what's six plus eight and be able to compute that, not just using a calculator, but by reasoning through it, using this type of knowledge encoded in reasoning based logic tokens that we're going to generate with this model. And when we train the model, we're using supervised learning for fine tuning, but we're also adding in a reinforcement learning step to collect different trajectories. And those trajectories are the trajectories of all the possible paths that we could be taking whenever we're reasoning. What are the subtasks for this? And what are the rewards that we're going to compute here? In this case, it's a very simple random reward, but I'm sure there's a more complex reward in the actual O1 model. We're doing adaptive inference. And what does that mean? It means that we're, the model dynamically selects what the best chain of thought is going to be based on the difficulty of the problem. And that is very important, right? Because some hard problems might require much more detailed reasoning tokens, many more detailed reasoning tokens than say a very simple problem. And that's what adaptive inference is for. And this is the main function. We just call the model, we input those parameters, and then we train it, and then we calculate the sum of five and seven as our example inference text. And we can run it right here and we see the output, right? So this works. Uh, you can see it today on GitHub. It works. The paper is live as well. Check it out in the GitHub repository. I've got the training file, the test file. I have it well commented. Thank you, O1 Preview, for helping me generate this. And I want to say that O1 is really special in this scaling time inference law that we discovered because it just means we can accelerate the advancement of intelligence that much faster. And I think that there is really no moat here that OpenAI has in terms of the algorithm, like all of it is there in the research, all the breadcrumbs are available to anyone who wants to find it. This code and this research paper should offer a good starting point. We're here to democratize AI knowledge, not keep it closed source. Sam Altman, although I love you, Sam, I look forward to seeing what you guys do with this code and with the research paper. So until next time, happy learning.